The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Coming up on the agenda. Libraries are always finding a way to meet the needs that exist in a community. Um, and, 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 and as those needs get greater, the library is stepping up. Then, some teenagers, a lot of teenagers, are doing really well and thriving. But we do, without question, have a higher number of teenagers that we are concerned about now than we did before the pandemic. That's ahead on the agenda. If you have set foot in a library in the past few years, you will undoubtedly have noticed that they're not just repositories for books. If you haven't dropped by, you're in for some surprises, good ones, that might just make you see libraries as vital places ready to serve a larger social purpose. With us to explain, let's welcome, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Shamichael Holman, Loeb Fellow at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University and co-founder of Libraries as Bridges. In Thornbury, Ontario, Sabrina Saunders, CEO and Board Secretary at the Blue Mountains Public Library. In Kitchener, Ontario, Mary Chevreau, CEO of the Kitchener Public Library. And here in our studio, Vickery Bowles, so-called city librarian at the Toronto Public Library, which she informs me is the largest library system in North America. Yes. In terms of numbers of branches. Yes. Marvelous. Uh, great to have you back here in our studio and to our friends in mm -hmm. Points Beyond. Thank you for joining us tonight on TVO. I just want to set up our discussion uh, because, of course, uh, you would all be all too aware that many people have been predicting the end of libraries for a long time. So let's go back and take a look here. So we, uh, Sheldon, bring this graphic up if you would. Here is something from 2005 from the MIT's Technology Review, so Michael, not far from you, entitled The Death of Libraries. Now that Google has agreed to scan millions of books, can the disappearance of libraries themselves be far behind, they asked. Let's zoom ahead to 2012. This article was in Forbes. As someone who has spent a fair amount of time analyzing business disruption, I think it's pretty clear that libraries are eventually going to fade away. And one more, this from TechCrunch in 2013. The internet has replaced the importance of libraries as a repository for knowledge. And digital distribution has replaced the role of a library as a central hub. This is evolution, not devolution. Okay, Shamichael, get us started on this. What did these predictors fail to understand? Because you're still here. Yeah, we're all still here. I think one of the things that those predictors failed to acknowledge was uh, the individuals who are actually using libraries, the people who come in, in the library each and every day for a variety of reasons. But I think this, these individuals also fail to take into account uh, the way that libraries saw themselves in the community and the vital needs and services that the library was providing uh, to, to, to their communities. Sabrina, how about you? What did they fail to understand in those predictions? I think they didn't understand that we have been around as a library sector since the days of Alexandria, more than 2,000 years ago, and we keep morphing into what our communities need. Vickery, uh, let me ask you this. If I asked you 25 years ago, what's a library for? You'd say, well, it's, you know, mostly it's a place to store physical books. If I were to ask you to characterize what a library is today, mm -hmm. how different would the answer be? Well, and, you know, I think what, what, what we're thinking about is we used to have, you know, we've always been about access to information and education, and that's, you know, been a great equalizer for everyone. But in the 21st century, access to technology is just as important, and no one can be successful in today's world without access to technology and know how to use it, and that's where public libraries come in. We provide access to technology. We teach people how to use it. We have um, everyday technology that most of us take to, for granted, but many people don't have access to. And then we have emerging technologies, such as um, green screens and 3D printers and Mac Pro computers. And, and so people come to the library to access content, um, to learn about technology and, and develop their digital literacy skills, but they also come to create content. So that's a big difference in the 21st century. Mary, if I asked you the same question, the difference between the library of 25 years ago and today, what would you say? I think it's the opportunity to uh, to be together, to commune. I think that social inclusion 
element. You know, there aren't very many places left actually where people can come, gather, uh, create, or just be uh, in, in, in society. So that social inclusion component has changed and we really have been able to uh, uh, develop our programs and services to meet those needs. So, Michael, let me ask you about one of your previous experiences, because I gather you were uh, involved in the redesigning of the Cosset Library in Memphis, and in doing so, you came to Toronto to check out what was happening in this city here. What did you see or learn about here that you brought to Memphis with you? Oh, so much. You know, I had a wonderful opportunity. The library project that we did here in Memphis, uh, under the direction of Keenan McCloy, who's a phenomenal leader, uh, the city mayor, uh, in, a, in a national initiative called Reimagine the Civic Commons, uh, afforded me the opportunity to come to Toronto uh, in the middle of 2018. Uh, and we visited a number of places, not just libraries. We went to uh, uh, community centers, we went to parks. Uh, and of course, you know, as someone who works for libraries, I had to sneak away and check out a couple of libraries. And so, you know, one of the really interesting things that I saw, and Victor's already talked about this, is just the way that they were thinking about technology and how they were thinking about not only giving access to technology, of course, she's talked about green screens and uh, uh, various recording equipment, uh, but also kind of providing access through technology. And what I mean by that is not just saying, hey, here's a range of things that we have in terms of computers and digital resources, but here's how you can use these things. Here's uh, a fundamental ways that you can use it to improve your life, uh, to, to upskill, to learn a new hobby, to uh, maybe change your uh, job prospects. And so that was really interesting. Also, something that I really loved was at the time, uh, was a, an innovator in residence program that I really, really love. And, and I saw this as a really interesting way of bringing the community in and really leveraging the, the knowledge and the strengths and the skills of the community and making the library a very relational place, not just a place where, hey, I come and I get a book and I leave or I come and, and I, I attend the library program, I leave. But it's like, no, I'm going to actually bring something with me. I'm going to bring uh, things that I'm passionate about. I'm going to share those uh, in a public space like like a library. And so we were able to use those things and, and really infuse a lot of that into the project that we did in Memphis. Sabrina, let me pick up on that with you. If we were to go into the Blue Mountains Public Library in Thornbury today, uh, what would be what would we be able to do beyond just borrow some books? Well, that's an excellent question. We have a creator space, which is what we call our maker space. Many libraries have these. And it is a place where you can come and play and explore and test out technology. So from little children being able to do animation programs to adults coming in and borrowing our professional videography equipment, uh, whether it's a case where you want to do an ad for your business or you just want to have you know, a great family event, these are things that you can do in libraries today. Our uh, coding programs are active for all children. And one of the speakers mentioned, uh, these are the skills that we need to build in our citizenry. It's not just about fun and playtime. Sometimes it's a case where you wanna test something out before you purchase it. Other times it's the only opportunity you have for economic reasons. But our society is requiring these aspects of digital literacy. So we're building these, sk these skill sets in our citizens. So hopefully we're building new job opportunities for adults and certainly uh, making sure that our youth are going to be strong employees of the future. Vickery, when did the library become more than just about borrowing books? Well, libraries have always been about that, to be perfectly honest. About more than just borrowing books? Just about more than books. You know, um, we've had, for instance, newcomer services in our libraries for many, many years. And this is where newcomer um, uh, agencies come into the library. We have them in about 16 of our branches. And they support newcomers uh, in, in making their way and in integrating into uh, Canadian and Toronto society. And, uh, and so public libraries have been about that for a long, long time. We support all sorts of different literature financial literacy, um, uh, digital literacy that we've been talking about. Uh, so the library's been about, about that for a long time, but certainly I think we think about books and we think about reading programs, we think about story times, which are all still the heart and soul of public libraries, but there's always been so much more going on. It's just that in recent years, it's accelerated. Yeah. Mary, I want to ask you about the pandemic, because I know if, if my own local library was any indication, uh, it, it really killed them, not to be allowed to be open at the time. And, and we, you know, something was definitely lost. 
How did the library system do what it did, or do what its traditional mission is, when uh, you couldn't keep the doors open? Well, it, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, public libraries in Ontario and around the country actually were remarkable in how they did keep their doors open. Even, even if we couldn't physically uh, be in our spaces, we quickly found a way to provide services through curbside pickups. So people could, in fact, still um, have access to, with, with the exception of, uh, you know, a period of time when everything was shuttered. But uh, libraries were the first to open. We were the first to remain open. We were the first to come back to our spaces. Um, we had programs for, as I mentioned, curbside pickup for uh, content. We um, really ramped up our digital access in terms of uh, what was available to to our communities. And we went as far as calling our, our senior citizens to make sure that they were okay because social um, isolation was a, a real uh, concern to many of us in our communities to to be able to have at least one phone call from somebody to check in on them meant, meant a lot to our seniors in, in, in Kitchener. Let me pick up on that angle with you, Michael, because that's, uh, well, before I ask the question, do I have this right? Do you live down the street from Robert Putnam who wrote Bowling Alone? Yeah, I am. I'm an acting far <laughs> You really do. Okay, very cool. Because, I mean, that that's, of course, a seminal book on the sort of, uh, you know, tragic collapse of so many American communities, and I guess up here, too, as well. And I, I wonder how you saw, you know, it was very tough when the doors had to be closed during the pandemic and that ability to be a community hub for libraries was not possible uh, when we were all shut down. But how do you see the library now as the place where, where the community can and needs to gather for free to deal with that social isolation that Robert wrote about so eloquently in his book? Yeah, and as, as others have mentioned, you know, uh, I'm spending my time here at Harvard this year thinking a lot about the public library as a site of encounter, as, as one of the final sort of remaining spaces uh, where people have the opportunity to encounter people who are, are different than them, right? And, and the library is achieving that through so many interesting ways. Um, number one, just as a space, before we even talk about the variety of programs and services that are offered, it is just the space for people to be able to gather, whether that's to come in and grab a coffee, whether it's to sit out in a courtyard and enjoy some shade, just this sort of wonderful space to be. But then on top of that, the library is now layering on lots of different programs um, that, that, that are drawing a variety of people. You know, it's interesting that even though uh, uh, we may have different political beliefs, even though we may be you know, different in terms of, of faith walks, um, there are a lot of things that we actually like to do together. People like to knit, people like to sew, people like to code, people like to learn new things. People like to discuss things that they're reading. Uh, and all these activities do a wonderful job of bringing people together, right? And, and, and this sort of creates a sort of cohesion in which people aren't othering anymore. It's like, oh, I know this person. I know that person. We go, we go to the library together. We attend a program together. And that is a, that does a wonderful thing for the social fabric of the community. You, uh, you are such a, a messianic and enthusiastic supporter of libraries. There's a great story that you tell, and I want you to tell it here, if you would, about how the different generations in Memphis interacted as a result of something you put together. Can you tell that story? Sure, and, and I must say that this, this, this was not solely my idea. We have a wonderful uh, uh, individual at the library system, Emily Marks, who put this together. But uh, the story of our library is, is one of access. And, and, and I think it's you know important to note that throughout the history of the library, there's always been a group of people who have either explicitly or implicitly uh, not felt as welcome as they should. And, and in Memphis, of course, it's well documented that for a number of decades, black people had very little access, limited access to the library system. Uh, and that changed in, in, in the late 50s with a lawsuit and a few years after that with a variety of sit-ins that happened in the system. Uh, and we were able to, through the library project that we did, able to find uh, many of the individuals who participated in the 1960 demonstrations. Uh, many of them were still in Memphis and they had very vivid stories. Uh, they had pictures of what it was like to step into these spaces. They had stories of what it was like to be arrested uh, 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 for stepping into these spaces. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that that history wasn't lost. We wanted to make sure that we honored those individuals. Uh, and thanks to the vision of the mayor, uh, uh, we were able to not only do a mural of the space, but we were able to uh, uh, bring these individuals into the library and connect them with uh, middle school students who, middle and high school students who were not too far from the library. And it was a really powerful moment for these uh, very young students to see, oh wow, there's history here. 
There are individuals here who had to fight, who had to struggle uh, uh, for access to the things that I'm not able to do in this library. Uh, and, and, and for the for, for the seniors, for those individuals who did the sit-ins, it provided them a wonderful opportunity to be able to share uh, um, why they thought it was important to make sure that the library was a place where everyone was welcome, where everyone felt like they could come into the rooms. Brilliant. Sabrina, uh, I want to follow up with you on this. Is it fair to say that it's not always the well-off and the not-so-well-off who are snuggling up together at the library? There's, there's maybe more separation there than people who run libraries would like to think. In other words, well, you know what I'm getting at. Could you speak to that? Certainly, we, we definitely cater to all aspects of our society. Uh, the haves, the have nots, uh, they're all here in our doors and they are interacting. And it's a place where diversity and equity is active in one place in our society. Uh, it isn't a case that, you know, we're not serving people that we would normally see out on the streets and not, not having those access. They are welcome here. They are a important part of our society and an important part of our programs and our services that we provide. Uh, so many of our libraries have gone one step further and started to look at social justice activism within the library. So whether it's a case of our social workers being present, our programs tailored toward people who need those types of services, or it's just our own staff who are being trained on mental health, wellness, and other aspects that we're that first line of defense for many people. Vickery, the library is involved in so many issues uh, including, I gather, food insecurity. How is the Toronto Library System involved in that? Well, that started with the pandemic. And so when we closed three years ago, like everyone else, uh, we had 100 branches closed. And at the same time, we heard through our city uh, that there was this real crisis with food banks. And they had lost volunteers because many of them were seniors and they had to stay at home. And they had lost their, their places um, to, to, to operate their food banks. Mm -hmm. So we um, uh, worked with North York Harvest and Daily Bread and uh, some other partners and we uh, opened up 12 of our branches as food banks. We asked um, our staff who are at home if anyone wanted to volunteer to uh, work in those food banks in the branches and within um, minutes, literally, um, we had all the volunteers we needed. The staff were so keen to get out there and, and help people. And uh, we used our book distribution center um, uh, for food distribution. We got all the books out of there and we used it for food distribution. And now today we have two branches um, still um, with food banks for, with North York Harvest in the uh, parking lot in, in shipping, uh, 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 jazzed up shipping containers. And, uh, and people are being served uh, wonderfully. And we're, this partnership has led to other programming on nutrition, on, um, on um, uh, building um, uh, gardens and, and teaching people how to garden and what food, uh, when you grow food, what it looks like and how you harvest it. Um, so it's been a wonderful partnership and it's been um, uh, really gratifying to be able to serve people in our communities at such a time of need. Sabrina, I gather Toronto's not the only system that does that. You want to tell us about the open refrigerator policy you've got? So open refrigerator programs are, are really important in our libraries and we, we can't all be the Toronto Public Library and have as many staff and branches. So we're doing it in smaller ways where there are simply refrigerators that are open. We can partner with food banks and it's a, a simple aspect of you can come in, take what you need. There is no signing in, no paperwork, just take what you need and others leave what they want. Uh, so these open refrigerator programs are really popping up across our library branches in Ontario. Mary, how about social workers? Do you have social workers in your library? We do. Uh, we have outreach workers that are, we have four outreach workers at our central uh, location, which is our downtown location. Um, and uh, they are embedded with our staff. They work side by side at the welcome desk or what used to be called the circulation desk. Uh, and they're really there to uh, support the community who uh, may be struggling, uh, whether it's homelessness, addiction, mental health, often all three, uh, but also there to uh, support staff, to train staff, to be there, uh, to really, um, help uh, all of our communities uh, succeed in our spaces. Uh, oh, you, you, you dropped a little pearl there, and I wanted to just pick up on that. You don't call it the circulation desk anymore, eh? How come? <laughs> 
Well, because we do more than that, I think uh, it's a little more integrated than it used to be, where it's just not not just that transaction anymore. So it's uh, re we refer to ours as a, as the welcome desk, where people can you know ask questions, they can be directed, they can of course still check out an item and return an item, but it's it's more than that, and we try to uh, again just by even embedding our uh, outreach workers as an example of why it's not a circulation desk anymore. Sabrina, do you see the library system as sort of part of the social safety net of society now? Oh, most definitely. Uh, we are that one place that you can come and not have to spend money. We're that one place often that people come for the only interaction that they get in a day. Our children come for after school, whether it's a formal program or simply that safe space between three o'clock and five o'clock when parents get home. We are the place that our our youth, our teens, our seniors, our vulnerable sector are looking for supports on a regular basis. All right, Shamichael, I'm following up with you on that then. If there's a lot of social work happening and a lot of these things that we don't traditionally associate with the mission of a library, I guess some people are going to ask the question, should that be part of the mission of a library system? How would you answer that? Well, that's a very complex question. Um, you know, it's been interesting to hear uh, the other responses from, from the other guests uh, about all of the ways that the library is evolving, right? And, you know, whether that is, you know, new partnerships, whether that's uh, food services, food security, whether that is even the sort of the way the library thinks about itself. Uh, I think it's important for folks to recognize that this is not like a fad. L libraries have been since the beginning. Libraries are always finding a way to meet the needs that exist in a community. Um, and, 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 and as those needs get greater, the library is stepping up. Uh, but you know what libraries, uh, and I think Victory could, 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 could attest to this, but libraries are having to continually answer is, what are the things that we can do? What are the things that we should do? And then what are the things that we just simply can't do, right? Uh, um, and, 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 and I think uh, it's important for libraries to answer that question, you know, based off of what's happening in their communities, but it's also important for the people that fund libraries to be mindful of this and, and, and what they're asking libraries to do. You know, at the heart of all of these programs, at the heart of all of these initiatives are staff members, people who have, a, who have a heart for the community, who want to meet the needs of the community. And often these folks are strapped. These people are being asked to do a lot of different things, uh, perhaps even more than what you might think of a librarian as doing. And so it's important that, you know, as in some cases, social safety, safety nets are failing, that if we're going to direct people to the library to get these services, that we fund libraries in, in, in an adequate way, and we make sure that the people who are offering these services in terms of library staff are actually paid uh, a decent salary. Let me get Mary on that as well in Kitchener-Waterloo. You know, there, there are a lot of people who are having a tough time in Kitchener, uh, particularly since so much of the manufacturing sector disappeared in this province, coming back now, but uh, Kitchener's had some tough times, and you've had your share of people who use the library system, perhaps for for purposes that it was not intended for. Uh, do, do you see the Kitchener Library System, for example, as a makeshift homeless shelter? Well, uh, you know, that isn't our mandate and our role, and that is not what we wish to be. Um, I think that we don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources to be uh, uh, offered uh, that kind of shelter service. So, um, you know, the short answer is no, uh, that we, uh, obviously we, as, as Vickery mentioned, we have a societal, uh, uh, incredibly difficult societal challenge right now, uh, in terms of social services, in terms of community and finding space for everybody. Um, so what I would say is everybody is welcome, just like Vickery said, and it's all about to me, and there's always going to be. You know, there's always tension uh, uh, when community gets together. It's just it, it's just a natural occurrence. Um, and so it's really finding that balance in the tension to ensure that everyone can, as I said, thrive and succeed in our spaces. Um, but no, we, we, we in fact don't want to uh, take the role of a shelter. That is not, uh, not our, our, our uh, mandate, our wish. Um, and so we work very closely with other community organizations to ensure that there is, uh, as much as we can, influence that there is space um, in a timely way. That there are washrooms. You know, at one time during the pandemic, the library was the only place that offered a washroom to anybody. Um, everything else was closed. So, uh, you know, working with other community groups to ensure that some of these services are available is really important and a role that probably none of us expected to be in, but here we are.
So, Michael, let me get you briefly on that as well. You, you mentioned that there are things that the library system shouldn't or can't do. Would being a shelter for homeless people be on that list? No, again, I, I think, you know, I, as, as has been stated, it's important for the library to be viewed as a space where everyone feels welcome uh, and for us to be able to offer that welcome without judgment. Uh, and we have to recognize that, you know, some of the individuals who, who meet that, you know, who, who need that are individuals who are, who are experiencing uh, uh, homelessness, right? Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's important for us to, under, to, to not uh, stereotype that one group of people. As has already been said, that there are a range of things that are happening there. There are people who are experiencing homelessness uh, because of, of pay, right? Like they're, they're not getting a living wage. There are some people who are experiencing that because of their mental health issues. There are some people who are experiencing that because maybe they served uh, the country in, in the armed forces and, and they didn't get the treatment that they needed. Uh, there are a lot of different things that are happening there. And sometimes I think we sort of lump uh, everyone into sort of this one category, this sort of ne negative stereotype of uh, that's not helpful for, for community dialogue. And so I think, the, you know, Libraries have and will continue to do everything they can to be able to, uh, 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 to to be a place that's welcoming for everyone. And as you said before, Steve, you know that does that is challenging. It is challenging when you try to bring lots of different people from from various backgrounds together. I, I'll share a story with you that I think may be very interesting. Um, one of the one of the individuals who frequented our branch, uh, he, he was one of the first people that would walk through the doors uh, um, as we opened up every morning. Uh, one day, I found out that this gentleman, you know, who was, who was experiencing uh, homelessness, I, I discovered that he had a talent to draw, that he could pick up any book in the library uh, and glance at that book for just about five minutes and go sit in a corner with a number two pencil and draw something worthy of being in any art museum in North America. <laughs> I said, hey, man, what might it be like if, 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 if you taught a class? What might it be like if, 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 we, if we sat you down with people who, who, who want to learn how to draw, learn how to sketch. He said, that, that's wonderful, right? And so now we began to, to, to uh, help other people see that, hey, this is not a, a group of people that is just a problem to solve, but also a group of people to be understood and to be loved and to be acknowledged as, as whole humans uh, as they are. Gotcha. Uh, we've got a few minutes left here, and I want to put an even more controversial issue on the table. And, Victor, you know all about this because you found yourself in the eye of this um, storm not too long ago. Mm -hmm you know, free speech yes. and the library and how the library sees its role in either promoting or curtailing free speech. Mm -hmm. There are controversial speakers and some people don't think that they ought to be allowed to rent a room and give a public address in a library. Uh, you thought differently. How much right. trouble do you get into on that? Well, it's very controversial, as you said. There's a lot of discussion, lots of media coverage. Um, certainly, you know, uh, a lot of um, uh, protests uh, against the decision in Toronto and, and discussions with our staff as well. But, you know, uh, the public library is a democratic institution. And uh, we've, uh, for years, we support literacy and a literate population and free and open access to a diversity of information and ideas. And we protect intellectual freedom and personal privacy, and we preserve the past. And what we're seeing in today's world are more and more challenges to our democratic values and freedoms, including free speech. And the public, li public library, uh, intellectual freedom and equity are two mutually reinforcing principles that are core to our values at the public library. So it's very important even more important today than ever before for us to stand up for those values. And what we're seeing in libraries across the United States in particular, but it's also happening in here in Canada, are these book bans. Um, and it's become politicized in the United States with late state legislatures um, um, making uh, laws to, to ban books and to take books out of school libraries and public libraries. Uh, and it's targeted at the LGBTQ plus community and at race and uh, racialized communities and, and content. And it's a very serious situation. We have drag queen story times in Canada that are being challenged um, and people are protesting against them and demanding that they be cancelled. This is a, a serious issue for us in a democracy and it's a really important for the public library to stand up for our democratic values and freedoms, for intellectual freedom, for free speech and expression and um, it's becoming more and more uh, important in today's world. Let me get Sabrina on this as well. You know Sabrina there are lots of people around us who are watching or listening to this right now who think that legal speech which may be controversial, 
ought not to find itself hosted at a local public library. What do you say? I, I completely agree with Vickery on this point. Uh, we stand up for intellectual freedom and free speech. What you personally believe and what you personally feel doesn't matter on that. Sometimes we have to stand up for things and books and materials that personally we find offensive, but it's because we have to uphold speech and intellectual freedoms. So it is at the core of what we do. Mary, how about you? It, yeah, ditto, ditto here. Uh, we feel very strongly that we need to stand up for free speech and intellectual freedom. And uh, I think that uh, it is uh, uh, divisive, certainly what we're seeing uh, south of us uh, and a little bit here too. Um, so uh, it is important, I think, as the role of public libraries, uh, certainly in Canada and Ontario, that uh, uh, leadership uh, leads uh, uh, to support uh, free speech uh, any way that we can. Well, um, let's do. Uh, let's finish up on this, uh, uh, I guess, more explicit example. So, Michael, I don't know if you're actually south of us. You're certainly east of us, but given uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts may actually be north of Toronto if I look at a map, but how would you answer that? Well, certainly, I don't speak for any you know library system. I, I, I am a, I'm a fellow you know at the design school, and so I, I'm not speaking for any uh, particular library system uh, at, at this moment. Uh, but I echo the, the, the sentiments that, that that the previous panelists have made, just in terms of you know being a space uh, that uh, that should value intellectual freedom. And that's where we'll leave it. Okay, intellectual freedom's a good spot to leave this on. I wanna thank Shamichael Hallman for joining us on the line from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Sabrina Saunders from Thornbury, Ontario, Mary Chevro from Kitchener, Ontario, Vickery Bulls from the Toronto Public Library here in the provincial capital. Great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Every teenager is, of course, different, but it's close to a universal given that life between the ages of 13 and 20 can be absolutely tumultuous for everyone involved. Lisa Demore is a clinical psychologist who's written several books aimed at helping teens and their parents manage the transition from child to adult. Her latest is called The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, Raising Connected, Capable, and Compassionate Adolescents and it brings Lisa Demore back to our airwaves tonight from Cleveland, Ohio. And it's really good of you, Lisa, to make some time for us again. Thanks so much. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me back on your show. I love your show. Oh, I appreciate that so much. There was a Canadian study that was uh, sort of taking a, a good, long, hard look at how teens had done through the pandemic and in terms of their mental health. And I think the shocking thing that emerged from this study was that they discovered that teens were a lot more resilient than they thought they would be. There were mental health adverse effects, but that teens had bounced back. And that surprised a lot of people because, of course, other studies that we've seen in the past say that this whole last few years has been an absolute disaster uh, for teens in particular as it relates to their mental health. I want, you know, knowing you're going to be on this program, I want to get your impression. What say you on that? So what I would say is that for a lot of teenagers, when life returned to normal, when they were able to go to school, when they were able to see their friends, a lot of them actually got right back on course, sort of returned to their normal developmental trajectories. And a lot of them were just so happy to be back with their friends and their teachers and their coaches that they embraced it fully. There are, however, a subset of teenagers who suffered tremendously through the pandemic and then have continued to suffer after the pandemic or who ran into difficulties during the pandemic that have been very, very hard to recover from. So the truth is it's a mixed picture. Some teenagers, a lot of teenagers, are doing really well and thriving, but we do, without question, have a higher number of teenagers that we are concerned about now than we did before the pandemic. Yeah, mental health got on everybody's radar in a way that I suspect it hadn't before the pandemic started. And a lot of teens are now, I guess, self, self-identifying, self-analyzing their mental health issues. How does one distinguish between the typical teen feelings of being confused, being anxious, because it's typical teenage stuff, and actual clinical depression and anxiety? That's such an important question, and that's really one of the main reasons I wrote this most recent book, which is to really help clarify what mental health is. 
Because too often, for all of us, much less teenagers, mental health gets equated with feeling calm or relaxed or at ease or happy. And those are wonderful things, but those actually don't define mental health. What we expect to see when we are looking for mental health are two things. One, having feelings that fit the circumstance, having an emotion that makes sense in the moment. So if a teenager is anxious because they have a big test coming and they're not ready, that's an appropriate re response. The other is handling the emotion appropriately, handling it well. So we'd love to see that teenager start studying or seek out help for the test. What we don't want to see are teenagers who just avoid altogether as a way to manage their anxiety or who might be like turn to substances as a way to bring their anxiety under control. So we're looking for feelings that fit and good management of those feelings. And then to your question about clinical depression and anxiety. The way that we think about sadness versus depression is that if you're sad, you're sad about something. And if something nice comes along, it tends to cheer you up. When you're depressed, you're sort of sad or low about everything, or there's a sense of a blankness. And even when things go well, you don't actually feel better. And for clinical anxiety, the way we make the distinction between healthy and unhealthy anxiety is that healthy anxiety happens in response to a threat. We all come equipped with anxiety. It helps to keep us safe. We want to have an anxiety reaction if um, we're walking down the street and somebody's suddenly walking very closely behind us in a way that is uncomfortable. Anxiety will help to keep us safe. We only diagnose clinical anxiety or unhealthy anxiety if anxiety is present but there's no threat, there's nothing wrong, or if the anxiety is way out of proportion to the threat, much more pronounced than makes sense. So if we go back to that teenager getting ready for a test, we expect to see a little anxiety about a big heavy test. We do not expect to see a panic attack. And if that happens, we um, are very good at treating both anxiety and then also depression. So does a panic attack almost automatically mean you should be seeking professional counsel for that kid? Not necessarily. Actually, panic attacks on their own are surprisingly common. About 30% of the population will have a panic attack over the course of their lives. We do get um, more concerned, though, if panic attacks start to occur regularly, and especially if they start to change behavior, if people start to avoid things so as not to have a panic attack. Psychologists are very, very much on the lookout for avoidance as a way to manage distress, and we have certainly seen more of that in the wake of the pandemic. And let me follow up on the substance abuse reference that you mentioned uh, in the middle of that previous answer as well. Does, does the revelation that your child may be abusing drugs or alcohol, again, automatically mean you should seek professional assistance for that child? That's an important question. Um, in truth, it is not altogether unusual for teenagers to experiment with substances. But experimentation can readily lead to unhealthy use, and certainly experimentation on its own can have really, really terrifying outcomes. So parents want to be attentive to how their teenagers are managing emotions, and they especially want to be attentive if they are under the impression or have any reason to believe that their teenager is using substances as a way to relieve uncomfortable feelings. So if they're sneaking the odd drink or the odd joint, that's not necessarily the end of the world. What you're describing falls within what is not, is certainly within the typical range of adolescent behavior. But again, things have changed in recent years. We certainly have much more frightening landscape of drugs, much more dangerous landscape of drugs. So the key on this is for parents to be having good conversation, open lines of communication with their teenagers about substances, about keeping themselves safe, really at any level. But in truth, it is not altogether unusual for teenagers to do some experimentation. Again, safety is the key. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't imagine there's a parent watching us now who has not experienced some kind of extreme behavior. They've witnessed extreme behavior by their teens. But I bet there are lots of teenagers who have witnessed extreme behavior by their parents as well. So can we establish off the top, is teenage extreme behavior, generally speaking, worse than adult extreme behavior? It's interesting. Teenagers are in the middle of a pretty fabulous and intense neurological renovation. Their brains are actually overhauling. And the nature of this renovation is that it upgrades the brain, it makes the entire brain faster, more efficient, more powerful. And for teenagers, this process unfolds in the way that the brain developed initially, which is from the lower order regions where the emotions are housed 
up to the higher order regions behind the forehead where perspective maintaining is housed. And what this means is that when teenagers become upset or activated, excited, their feelings are really, really powerful and really, really intense and can, in fact, outmatch their ability to have a good sense of control or perspective. We generally expect this to see, to see this kind of come into balance by about age 24. And so typically, adult reactions to powerful emotions are a bit more regulated than adolescent reactions to mm -hmm. powerful emotions. That said, I would say one of the hardest things about the pandemic for teenagers is just as they were going through something incredibly difficult, so were their families, so were their teachers who care for them. They were themselves really struggling, and everyone who constitutes their support system was also struggling. So that is part of what made this such an incredibly hard time. Mm -hmm. Emotions have long been seen as the enemy of reason. And I want to ask you whether you believe that to be the case. Well, most of the time that is not the case. The way that psychologists regard in emotions is that they're fundamentally informational. They are data about how our lives are going. And we want to tune into them, both the positive and the negative, for feedback on our choices, on how you know we're moving along in our lives, and to really use both negative and positive emotions as guidance for what we want to do less of or more of. Now, for teenagers, every once in a while, emotions can get the better of their reasoning. And the way psychologists think about this is in terms of what we call cold and hot reasoning. So cold reasoning is the kind of reasoning that teenagers do when they are in situations that are not charged by social or emotional factors. So this might be, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday when they're talking with their parent and the parent asks like, you know, what are the plans for tonight? What are you gonna do? And the teenager may say, I'm going to this party, but I don't intend to drink. And the teenager in that situation almost always means it. But what we know is that for teenagers in particular, when they get to the party, Hot reasoning can take over. This is a different way that they think. It is very much informed by wanting to be connected socially or by you know revved up emotions. And so once they get to the party, if someone they like offers them a beer, they may very well drink that beer. So what parents need to do as they are talking with teenagers, especially about safety, especially about making plans, is under cold conditions, those afternoon in your kitchen conditions, we want parents to help teenagers make plans for hot conditions. So the teenager says, I'm not gonna drink, that's not my plan. And the parent says, that's terrific. Okay, what is the plan if you get to the party and that kid you have a crush on offers you a drink, what are you gonna do then? And really try to think it through. This will not guarantee that the teenager is gonna make the right choice, but it is much better for teenagers in hot conditions if they are not trying to figure things out on the fly. Now, I'm not going to pretend for a second this is not a question, this next question, that is uh, out of the mouth of a parent as opposed to a kid. Uh, so I admit that bias right up front here. Here's the question. Why are teenagers so mean to their parents? Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. <laughs> One is teenagers have very powerful emotions, and sometimes their brakes don't work so well. So it's not altogether unusual for teenagers to say something that is unkind and to regret it as soon as they've said it, but it's out of their mouth and there's nothing they can do. Another reason that teenagers can be unkind to their parents is that teenagers are trying to become separate. And part of how they separate themselves from us is to push away, to seem rejecting. And the key in this is for parents to not take it personally that teenagers, by their nature, need to establish their independence. They don't always do it in the nicest way. And usually the best response for a parent is to not react to the initial unkindness, to say something like, I'm gonna pretend like I didn't hear that, or I don't think that came out the way that you meant for it to come out, or even something like, you know what? We don't ever talk to you like that. You're not gonna to talk to us like that. Why don't you try again? I'm not sure anybody is that calm when they hear something from their kid in that moment to respond the way you just did, although in an ideal world, I agree, that's the way to go. Let me follow up with this. Do teenagers, as a general rule, are they harder on mom or dad? You know, when we've looked at the data on this, especially between girls and their mothers, what we see is that um, the relationship between girls and their mothers can be quite close, and at times it also can be quite a bit more combustible. 
Um, boys, I don't think we actually have pr particularly pronounced differences in terms of the treatment of parents, but we do know with girls that they can be harder on their moms. And again, we think that has to do with both the fact that they are sort of more intimate and often more intense in their relationships, and also girls are often working harder to push away and to become individual and separate, mm. and they don't always do it in the kindest ways. The key with teenagers is to really understand that adolescence is not something that teenagers are doing to their parents. It is a really challenging developmental phase that teenagers are working their way through. I'm always reminded of that line in The Godfather, tell Michael it was just business, right? It's, exactly. They don't mean it personally, it's just business. That's the way it goes. They don't, and here's another way to think about it. Teenagers have to become independent. That is their job. We want them to really be ready by about age 18 to go move away and move on. To become independent while living under their parents' roof, basically being you know, needy of their parents, depending on their parents for basically everything, is an incredibly hard thing to do. So the way teenagers do it is they accomplish psychological independence. They become more private. They are um, more reserved when they're with us. They can push us away at times. And if adults who are around this can appreciate that this is a tricky thing, to become an independent person while being dependent on the adults in the home, I think it can make it easier to not take it personally. There's so much about gender differences today. And uh, while we don't necessarily have to get into all of the uh, ultra-political uh, observations about that right now. Could you weigh in on when you think gender differences matter and when they don't as it relates to teens? Well, so when I think about my work in the area of emotions, one very clear finding that we have with regard to traditional gender categories is that girls are socialized to talk more fluently about their feelings, and they're also given more cultural permission to talk about a wide range of feelings. They can be angry, but they can also be sad or anxious. Boys, on the other hand, are generally socialized not to be very expressive about emotion, and to the degree that they are allowed emotion in sort of cultural context, they tend to usually only be allowed to be angry, to express anger, or among other boys, to express pleasure at someone else's expense. So not particularly pleasant emotions and also a very narrow range. So as adults, what we want is to raise kids of any gender who are comfortable expressing a wide range of emotions. And one thing I think that can make a big difference is especially for boys, is if the men around them are able to talk more fluently about their own emotions and also to ask boys about their feelings. One thing that became clear to me as I was working on this book is that when boys, and it's usually around you know, age 12, 13, 14, when they're really working hard to consolidate a sense of masculinity, a lot of boys can decide that feelings are for girls or talking about feelings is for girls. And then if they happen to live in a heterosexual two-parent household, if the only person who is raising conversations about feelings is their mom, that may be really well-meaning. It also may prove their point. It may confirm that for them that talking about feelings is a female thing to do. So that's why it's so important that for boys in particular, the men in their lives, either in the home, school, elsewhere, are the ones who really take up the work of developing a language for feelings and talking about a wide range of feelings, including vulnerable emotions. But if I heard you right, it sounded like uh, men are socialized to be that way and girls are socialized to be a different way. How much of all of what you've just described, though, is actually innate in each of us? None of it. I promise you, at the moment that um, kids are born, they could go any variety of directions. There is nothing biological about the fact that girls are um, socialized to be or ultimately become much more fluent in the expression of emotion and boys less so. It is very much a cultural phenomenon. When does a teen's gender matter in terms of the way they experience mental health problems? So one of the really um, classic and consistent findings is, again, it's a function of socialization, is that when girls are in emotional distress, they tend to collapse in on themselves. They tend to experience depression or anxiety. And then when boys are in emotional distress, they tend to act out. So they may um, be unkind to others. They may get themselves in trouble. They, you know, may engage in delinquent behavior. And so we've always sort of noticed this distinction. We make, we call them internalizing disorders versus externalizing disorders. And the key thing for us to remember is there, this is all distress. 
and, and there's not one form of distress that we care more about than another. And that boys especially may need an extra measure of empathy because they don't always express distress in a way that um, makes people feel very caring towards them. Hmm. Okay, let's, um, I'm gonna go back on what I just said a few minutes ago and let's get a little political right now because okay. I have to say when I was, um, well, when I was a teenager, it's, it's possible I was thick as a plank and I did not appreciate the fact that there were people who identified as um, non-binary back in the day. And there are, of course, um, infinite more numbers of kids nowadays who are identifying as non-binary and beyond. Help us understand why that's happening now. Well, one thing we can say for sure is that gender has never been as binary as we have treated it as being historically, that it's always been something quite a bit more fluid. But in truth, we are now raising a generation of teenagers who view gender as vastly more fluid than previous generations did. So I don't know that it's that um, it wasn't fluid and now it has become fluid, but we certainly are raising a generation of teenagers who do not feel so confined into traditional gender categories um, and who can identify other categories in between categories or categories that include both genders or who also feel free to move across different gender categories. And this is a pretty um, dramatic difference from pre previous generations, and without question, one that a lot of parents are trying to catch up to. So is that to say it has ever been thus, and we just may not have been as hip to it back in the day? That's what most psychologists think. Let's steer our discussion now towards conflict. I know I hear from grandparents and parents that today's kids, today's teenagers, What's the right expression here? Pushback is not stark enough. Uh, they're lippier, they're more in your face as teenagers today than, than either my generation or our parents' generation ever would to the previous generation when they were growing up. What's that about? You know, we don't really know, but here's a theory that I'll float for us. We talk a lot about social media, we talk a lot about the harms of social media, one of the things we don't actually talk about nearly enough is the fact that teenagers are often engaging in pretty rapid and high-level discourse on social media. When I've interviewed teenagers about their emerging political understandings or their views on controversial topics, they will often tell me that it's by engaging about those topics online with peers or with people they don't know, where they can see how arguments are made, then they can see you know, counter arguments, and then they can see criticisms of the arguments, and watch it all unfold, that they really learned about how to make cases, you know, what they believe in, they have very strong views often. And what I will say is that when I am talking to teenagers, I'm often quite impressed by how sophisticated their reasoning is, how deeply they have thought about very complex things, how developed their arguments are, how quick they are to point out the shortcomings and the arguments that other people make. And it's not always fun to be on the receiving end of this, but I think we should actually stand back and honor the fact that teenagers today are often much more fluent in a pretty sophisticated form of argumentation than we were as teenagers, and they are certainly thinking about, I would say often, much bigger and deeper things than we were thinking about as teenagers. Well, okay, but I'm gonna follow up on that with, with uh, not a very sophisticated follow-up, but I'm gonna get right down in the gutter, and I'll tell you where it comes from. I just did a book on a former Prime Minister of Canada who I remember shaking his head in shock when he saw how his grandchildren were talking to his own children and the use of profanity which never would have been allowed in the former prime minister's household when he was doing the parenting and he just you know he kind of shook his head at, at what this generation of parents allows the younger generation to get away with nowadays have we given this younger generation uh, too much freedom, too much agency to speak their minds and, and be lippy. Well, I promise you there's no generic that describes all families. But what I think is important is that when young people are making arguments or when they're in disagreement with us, that we capitalize on those moments to teach them how to make their points in a way that is respectful. And there's a couple of reasons for them to do that. First of all, it's just generally a good thing to be respectful. Second of all, it's actually how you get taken seriously. So if um, a young person is making an argument that is a fair enough argument, but they're going about it in a way that is off-putting or offensive, that's a great time for the adult on the receiving end of it not to react 
you know, in a way that is unpleasant or, you know, meets them in that, um, you know, kind of rolling in the mud place, but instead says, hey, you know what, you may have a point, but if you're going to make it that way, no one's going to listen to you. No one's going to take you seriously. Can you make it in a more sophisticated and also respectful way? Hmm. Okay, Lisa, there's so much in this book, and I'm, um, you know, we could talk for hours here and still not get through all of it, but I do want to ask you just one final question, and that is, is there anything I have not asked about so far that I've, that I've missed that you think is really important for, I guess, parents and teens who are watching this right now? What I would say is that if we move toward the definition of mental health that I proposed at the beginning, that feelings, you know, are going to happen, distress on its own is not evidence of a mental health concern. In fact, it can often be signs that the person is working perfectly, that we really focus instead on how emotions are managed, not whether they are positive or negative. Then it really gets us into an interesting conversation about how we manage emotions. And the way psychologists think about this is you don't prevent distress, you don't get rid of it quickly, but you can regulate it. And in regulating it, what we're actually going to rely on is both strategies that involve expression, expression, talking about feelings, sometimes expressing them non-verbally in ways that do no harm, such as going for a run or playing music. But it also involves having ways to bring emotions back under control. Um, I really am interested in all of the ways that teenagers on their own can tame negative emotions. They comfort themselves, they find a brief distraction, they engage in problem solving. And I'm really interested also in how adults can support both the expression of emotion to get relief and also strategies that help teenagers feel like they've got their feet back under them. Amen. The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, Raising Connected, Capable, and Compassionate Adolescents. And we are delighted that it has brought Lisa Demore back to our airwaves tonight here in the province of Ontario. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you for having me. I'm Steve Paik, and thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.